Good evening. My name is Jennifer Dickinson, and I am here with Bob Bryce, who I'd like to um, introduce to you. He is going to talk about the Klamath Basin Environmental Restoration Strategy. Bob works specifically on the Klamath National Forest in the, I'm sorry, in the Klamath National Forest as an administrator selected by the Secretary of Agriculture and also the Chief of the Forest Service from 1981 to 1989. And his observations were developed as both a multi-resource and land management as a result of his experience for nine Western forests and the province of Ontario, Canada. He's going to summarize his visits and observations on the Klamath River so you can understand the river today. This has been a 13 year scientific effort for four of my associates and myself. And during that particular time, there was a stakeholder presentation made in February of 2008 by the Klamath Settlement Group, which consists of 26 stakeholders. They represented farms and ranches, four tribes, four federal agencies, four state agencies, and two counties, and 10 government non or excuse me, 10 non-government conservation and fishing groups. And what they did is they released for the public to review a document to guide the interest of people that wanted a plan to manage the Klamath River. It was interesting to take on this scientific review because uh, what preceded our efforts in order to do this, we had to look at the various actions that the stakeholders wanted to pursue. The first one that they pursued was they wanted to rebuild the anadromous fish population in the river they wanted to restore the habitats for the anadromous fish population. They wanted to improve fish survival by enhancing the quantity and quality of water. They wanted to introduce anadromous species, mainly salmon, to the black parts of the river basin. They finally decided that they would want to include allocation of water to sustain ag agriculture and the wildlife refuges and stabilize power costs and then to make sure that whatever was taken on in the planning effort, it would be a program intended to ensure mitigation to the counties that may be impacted by their action plan with the hydroelectric power generation facilities. In the course of review, we were able to get a series of information from Pacific Corps in their 2005 attempt to relicense the Klamath River resource systems that existed from in, in Oregon and California. And there were five that they had discussed in their augment in their study. When we reviewed these water use and distribution documents, we realized that the focus for the stakeholders was to offer new environmental restoration strategies. The proposals of the settlement group beginning implementing action has and is still being provided and it has been over a period of time receiving negative comments on the agreements because of the two state involvement, the two coastal tribes were Pacific Corps' parent company and still try to find an agreement that they could work together. It has taken us these six year, 13 years to compile data and is now ready to release that scientific foundation 
on how to achieve an overall environmental restoration strategy. So, to t obtain a network of actions in the uses of land and water, we quickly viewed in its entirety the 10 million acre Klamath Basin. And what we found in the review of that 10 million acre Klamath Basin is that it had two regions. One region was designed uh, as the lower Klamath Basin and it had an area of precipitation that exceeded between 40 and 50 inches a year of snow and rainfall. In the upper region, which is referred to as the arid dry region, we identified the fact that uh, the rainfall for that particular region would be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 inches per year. The, the difficulty with having those two separate uh, separate opportunities to receive precipitation makes management extremely difficult and it also calls a series of concerns amongst the 70,000 residents that have elected to live in the entire Klamath Basin. My presentation today was to develop the two regions into reaches. Reaches that would expose the people living there, would identify the resources that are there, and the use and distribution of water. The reaches that I have undertaken were borrowed from hydrologists and climatologists and have been the focus of with the scientific studies that, as I said earlier, began in the year 2010. I feel comfortable making this analysis and the reason I feel comfortable doing it is because of my career experiences as a member of the Forest Service. I have experienced in nine different national forests in the West, and I was also attached to a forest management team that dealt with the Providence of Ontario, province of Ontario in Canada as the headwaters of the Mississippi. The presentation to the Siskiyou County Cities and Community Service Districts provides a collating opportunity of many career visits with, 3 million Klamath, with the 3 million Klamath National Forest. My experiences on operations were developed as both a multiple resource land management administrator with intense concern for the use and distribution of the river flows dynamics. It, at each early stay in my visit, I couldn't help but reflect on the reasons that the Secretary of Agriculture and the Chief of the Forest Service provided me with the chance to be the supervisor. And when I first arrived, they asked me to engage myself in the river and to take a hard look at the possibility of creating the Klamath into a national wild and scenic rivers and that was a very detailed look and in order to arrange to get that kind of information I managed over time to cover every foot of the Klamath River from its source in Oregon to its outlet in the Pacific Ocean. These frequent trips that I took with several forest staff, initially registered a silvicultural difference between the eastern and western half of the forest. And those two regions set many different management tools and utilizing the tools in each of those regions depended very heavily on the availability 
of precipitation. Region 1 of the Klamath Basin, Reach 1, excuse me, of the Klamath Basin is the ocean and tributary reach. You can go ahead and get up. Yep. Reach 1, as I mentioned earlier, is the takes place as Reach 1, and it is essentially 200 miles in the, in the um, Pacific Ocean and a two and a half mile estuary. And the important part of the estuary is the fact that that is the location where the salmon first make the adjustment from the marine environment that they were in until they matured to a to a freshwater environment that take has to take place so that they can continue their pathway from uh, the estuary on up into the 257 mile Klamath River which is the total availability of water from its source to the ocean. The second, the interesting thing about the Pacific Ocean is that the Fish and Wildlife Service for the state of California has identified the fact that, and has studied, excuse me, the fact that since 1978, there have been very different in uh, escapements on part of the salmon. One particular year, the escapement was at the most 19,000 fish. Another year, the escapement was at the most 225,000 salmon. The interesting reason for that shift in the population that escapes into the river is because of the Pacific interdecadal oscillation that occurs in the ocean. Some years the ocean uh, will have a temperature, a warm temperature, and during those years that it has the, the warm temperature, the ocean is, uh, has, ha, is, is such that it produces a low volume of plankton, and plankton, of course, is the food that is used for the salmon to grow to maturity in four years. Other years, the ocean temperature is, uh, is uh, cold, and there's lots of plankton as a cold in the cold water environment. And sometimes the Klamath mature at age three and become bigger than what might have occurred during the time when the Klamath uh, was in a warm water temperature. Re re reach two is an area that is essentially administered by three tribes. The tribe that uh, in, in Reach 2 is the Riganini tribe and the Yurok tribe and the Hupa tribe. And those three tribes each have an opportunity to utilize the salmon that have escaped from the ocean and can do so utilizing nets and, and fishing gear and the federal government has made arrangements that they can take 50% for sustenance and commercial use of, of, uh, of the available salmon. The other important thing and value of, of uh, Reach 2, which is referred to as the Twin Trinity Reach, is the fact that the Trinity Reach has two major reservoirs, and those two major reservoirs support the flow of the Trinity River, but more importantly, they also send water to the Sacramento Valley for irrigation in the Sacramento Valley. So look at that particular reach as a reach that not only utilizes resource water, but also exports 
water from the Klamath Basin to the Shasta Valley. Good. The third, the third re reach in the uh, Klamath River system is the is referred to as the public land reach. Two national forests, the Six Rivers National Forest and the Klamath National Forest, um, are have the maintenance re resource maintenance responsibility for that particular reach. It's about a hundred miles long, and it contains uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of sixty tributaries. The reach also, because of its availability of precipitation, is uh, has a very good silvicultural responsibility in the growth of trees. And a lot of people that live in that part of the basin make an income from forest products. The, import, the per, most important point of that particular area is the fact that the uh, tributaries in that particular area have, uh, and there's quite a few of them, but there was a study done in 1988 and 1989 by the Forest Service and the Experiment Station, and during that period of study, it was identified that 13 of those 60 tributaries were available to produce Reds, which is the area where salmon spawn and put their eggs, and as a process of of uh, egg, uh, depositing their eggs, uh, we had found that there were about nine thousand reds available in that particular area, and that those nine thousand reds could produce if they were utilized over 500,000 adult uh, fingerlings, which at some point in time would become ad adult salmon. Region four, or reach four, is what we would refer to as the uh, checkerboard reach. That reach was designed, it is checkerboard, private land and public land, and the public land is even sections and the private land is private sections. And the private land is essentially land that was made available by the Northern Pacific Railroad when it built their railroad to the west and it was granted certain pieces of land in order to do that. And the fruit growers timber country is essentially have that particular area for uh, logging and exporting water from to the different sawmills, exporting timber, excuse me, to the different sawmills in Siskiyou County. The importance of this particular reach is the fact that it is also the location for a series of, of administrative uh, responsibilities. The first administrative responsibility, obviously, is the uh, administration by the Forest Service. A second would be an administration quarters for the Fish and Wildlife Service. A third would be the administration of fire suppression, and that being done by the California uh, 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 Fire Agency. There's also opportunities for people to come and visit to get information and interpretive services and know a little bit more about the uh, Klamath Basin and places to go and visit to see what's going on. The interesting thing about this particular region, uh, reach is the fact that there was a public law a number of years ago, uh, 1957 to be exact, when uh, the Ninth Circuit Court indicated that there would be a release of water out of Iron Gate Reservoir during August and September and October to be sufficient 
for the migration of salmon to the hatchery, which is located at the foot of Iron Gate Dam. Reach number five, which I consider to be the most controversial reach in the uh, Klamath Basin, has, a, has numerous resource opportunities. One of those resource opportunities is obviously the production of carbon-free hydroelectric, electri hydroelectric electricity. It, another possibility in that particular reach is the fact that uh, there is um, a, that is a area that's very present to, to at one point in tomb, time to the Shasta tribe. And the Shasta tribe saw this as a place, this particular portion of the Klamath River as a place where temperatures were of such a nature that they could live there year round. They also found that there was plenty of fish and hunting opportunity, fishing and hunting opportunities. And they also had the opportunity uh, to establish 18 villages and become what we would refer to at, as a farmer's market because of the availability of the different um, availability of the, of the different resources that could be exchanged or bartered by the Shastas for various tribes in Northern California. What we have found that is so other, that is so interesting about this particular reach is the fact that uh, a major study was done by the Rocky Mountain Experiment Station in uh, 1997. And what they found in that major study is that there is a, a strain of salmon called the red band salt trout, salmon trout, that at one particular point was occupying the, occupying uh, for, for um, growing, a young, uh, for egg taking a habitat for egg taking, or for egg t planting. And in the course of that, they used Fall Creek as one of their uh, areas of, um, one of their areas of, uh, of, of uh, habitat. And an, another area that was used w was in, in the Copco area where they also had an opportunity to uh, provide habitat for some of the streams in, in, in the Copco Reservoir. We have found through the study that there, through the studies that have been done for in scientific studies that have been done we have found that there are there were two reefs in that particular part of the river and one reef was uh, located uh, in the iron gate uh, reservoir and the other reef was located in the copco reservoir and what was so interesting about those two reefs is that they, J.C. Boyle in his 50 years on the Klamath indicated that they at one point in time were about 130 to 150 feet high. There are studies going on right now that will determine, sonar studies that will determine the location of those reefs and to some extent will identify the height of those particular reefs because the indications are by the Rocky Mountain Experiment Station that the landlocked salmon that were the landlocked salmon that were in that part of the uh, uh, ocean uh, river uh, never proceeded below uh, the reef in Iron Gate. And what was so interesting is the reference to those particular salmon are predatory salmons. They do not live on plankton, but they do live on 
uh, the minnows of other species of fish and chances are very good that they were the fish that the Indian Tom and Indian Jake, Tom from the Shastas and Jake from the Modoc, were able to spear fish at these two reefs and transport, backpack those two reefs to the tribes, the Klamath tribes, the Snake River tribes, and the Modoc tribes, and have them available for bartering uh, by the the uh, tribes that were resident in that part of the uh, reach. I'm going to work now on up from that reach to the next reach, and the next reach that we will talk about is the it begins the reach in Oregon. This is uh, reach number six. And reach number six we have determined to be the Keno Reach. And the important part of the Keno Reach was the fact that it has 13 gates in the dam. And because of those 13 gates in the dam of the Keno, of the Keno Dam, they are able to manipulate the flow of water from its sources above it. And the four sources above it are Keno Reservoir, Lake Iwana, Iron Gate, or excuse me, uh, Upper Klamath Reservoir, and Agency Lake. And the production of water from those reservoirs, uh, are, when not used for irrigation purposes for the Klamath Project, can be released into the Klamath River and the very controlling point of how much water comes into the state of California is because of how much might be released as a result of the Keno, Keno Needle Dam. Within the area that I just mentioned, region, uh, Reach 6, there are also a major waterfall area and over 275 birds and including uh, geese and ducks and others, waterfall, that, trans that provide a flyway from Mexico to Canada. And the flyway is pretty much a place where the waterfall can rest in the various reservoirs and marshes and develop their young to maturity and be in a position at some particular point in time to retrace the flyway steps back to Mexico or Honduras or one of the other uh, countries in South America. It is very also very interesting about this particular reach that the um, availability of water at, that is stored goes through a series of canals into the forest, into the product, into the forest, uh, excuse me, into the federal uh, irrigation area. And what goes on in the 230,000 acres of the federal irrigation area is crop production and also, as I mentioned earlier, a place for waterfall to nest and grow their youngs to a certain ability. Very interesting reach because it economically is a very important reach. And it also was had available to it the, um, the, uh, one of the strains of the landlocked salmon. And that particular strain of landlocked salmon used to visit the Williamson, the Sprague, the Wood, and the Saikam River. And that was their area for, rest for uh, habitat to uh, go ahead and, and provide reds for the growth of those particular fish. We have a picture uh, in our documentation of one of those uh, pick one of those uh, 
of, of, of salmon. And in that particular picture, it shows that they're over two feet long and weigh in the neighborhood of about 32 to 36 pounds. So it's a very sizable fish. The other strain, which is also landlocked, lived in the Lost River area, which is also part of Reach 6. And they, in, at one particular point in time, were noted because they managed to go to the um, area that I mentioned earlier in area five or reach five where they had the opportunity to uh, spawn in both Spencer Creek and Fall Creek. As a result of, of the those reaches, very productive from the standpoint at one point in time of landlocked salmon. And today they're on the edge of, of being close to uh, 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 loss because they, they have not been able to maintain their productivity as a result of, of uh, not having sufficient area for habitat development. The last reach, which I refer to as the natural flow reach, is reach number seven. Reach number seven, Ken, is a very sizable reef, and it has in the neighborhood of uh, about uh, almost 5 million acres, but there's two national forests in that particular reach, and those two national forests uh, each occupy about 1 million acres of public land. The, also in that particular reach are 90 acres that are irrigated, and there's also in that particular reach a three waterfall refuges, and so you can see the importance of that particular reach from the standpoint of the availability of resources. We have uh, determined in examining that particular reach, the uh, volume of water that at some particular point can leave those, hydro those hydrographic areas and it's somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five million, three to five hundred thousand acre feet of water is produced by that particular reach of the Klamath River. That re at, at a low point or a low water year for that particular area means that there would be about three thousand cubic feet discharged into into um, Upper Klamath Reservoir. Upper Klamath Reservoir holds about 500,000 acre feet and is the principal reservoir to provide water to the federal irrigation project. There, on other, uh, at another time, when you have a wet water year, we have found that uh, the production of water for those particular hydrographic areas uh, is probably exceeds about 5,000 cubic feet a second, so there's plenty more water. So there is a lot of opportunity for the management of water for the entire Klamath River system that is determined by what happens in the Oregon portion of the Klamath Basin. Um, there was a few points that I think that I'd like you to come and address um, in closing. One, um, uh, we, we wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why the Secretary of Agriculture um, submitted a letter to FERC. And then um, if you can let the uh, audience know why that is so important with the Klamath restoration. 
Well, I can conclude my presentation by saying from an informal standpoint that in February, the Secretary of Agriculture, and, and it's a good reason why, it's because so much of the Klamath watershed is in national forest ownership, took the position that at any activity that occurs uh, in the way of developing a management plan for the Klamath River or an environmental restoration improvement plan for the Klamath River will be follow the law. And in my studies, I have found that there is at least 26 laws that apply to the use of the di and distribution of water associated with the Klamath River. The other interesting thing is just two weeks ago, we received a letter from the Secretary of Interior. And the Secretary of Interior took the position that the two most rivers that needed study and scientific understanding were the Klamath and the Colorado. And as a result of the work that the, the, secret, the two secretaries have, have come up with, they have decided that uh, there is a, a real good opportunity for doing something favorable for the environmental improvement of, and elimination of concerns because the Klamath River is a now has become a very low distribution year because of, of water distribution because of climate change. We decided that maybe to be in, in advance a bit of what goes on uh, with, the present, with the Secretary of Agriculture's work and the Secretary of Interior's work, that uh, we would provide a strategy and have done so to Siskiyou County. And that particular strategy says that here are the action items that should be taken to bring the entire Klamath River back to its full production and, and, uh, 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 and assistance for providing the flow of water that can meet all of the use and distribution needs. The first item that we, per pre we identified was a water quality treatment plan at Keno. We have found with, because of studies done by uh, the Bureau of Land Management uh, a number of years ago that there are toxic situations existing in both uh, Iron Gate and, and uh, or excuse me, in both the Upper Klamath Reservoir and, uh, and, uh, and the other two uh, uh, storage areas at the Keno Reservoir and Lake Iwana. A second uh, position that we have taken is that we want to develop more off-river storage and we have identified a location to provide off-river storage for the watershed is at Buck Lake, which is uh, on the extreme western edge of Upper Klamath Lake and in the state of Oregon. A third possibility to improve the health of the Klamath River is that we want to have a, a uh, identity and location of the antique reefs in Iron Gate and Copco. Uh, we believe that uh, those antique reefs really served a purpose for the, Indian, the tribes that represent that particular area and uh, they uh, and, and also other tribes that may stop with in one of the 18 villages along the way on, uh, that were headed for what we refer to as the largest western trade area for tribes at Yannick Mountain on the Sprague River. 
The fourth possibility that we think is extremely important at this point in time is the augmentation of the tributary water flows at, on the Shasta and Scott River. Uh, they could uh, do a whole lot of improvement if we had an opportunity to augment the flow from, uh, from the reservoir and make the Shasta and Scott both a productive uh, tributary for the flow of water and salmon. And the fifth one that we have identified in, in, in our environmental habitat uh, uh, st strategy was to develop the spawning habitats in the 13 tributaries that uh, are above Trinity River on public lands. And we believe that by, by improving those 13 tributaries to be uh, re to, to be of interest to the salmon, we would be able to increase the population of salmon by 500,000 uh, people, or 500,000 fingerlings. So the restoration project um, um, basically envelops those five key points that you just yeah, brought the in. It, it is the strategy that we would propose as a result of the 13 years of scientific study that uh, w we and my associates have examined and uh, have reported to Siskiyou County. And Siskiyou County has a the Siskiyou County Flood Control Water Conservation District that particular water conservation district has a series of requirements for Siskiyou County that put them in a position to do a very good job of water management for the Klamath River. Well, thank you very much for your presentation today. I hope that um, if anyone has any questions uh, that they reach out to us. Um, we can be reached through the Siskiyou Media, or you can reach us through the Siskiyou Water Users Association. Association. Thank you once again, Bob, for presenting your history of the Klamath River, the reaches, and all of the effects that are going on today in our valley. Well, thank you. Thank you for helping me out. <laughs>